So there is, there is a kind of terrible irony that at the point that we are best able to understand and appreciate and value the richness of life around us, we are destroying it at a higher rate than has ever been destroyed before. And, and we are losing species after species after species, day after day, just because we're burning the stuff down for firewood. And this is a kind of terrible indictment of our understanding. But you see, we make another mistake because we think somehow this is all right in some fundamental kind of way because we think that this is all sort of meant to happen. Now let me explain how we get into that kind of mindset because it's exactly the same kind of mindset that the kakapo gets trapped in because his what, what has been a very successful strategy for the kakapo over generation after generation, for thousands and thousands of years, suddenly is the wrong strategy and he has no means of knowing because he's just doing what has been successful up till then. And we have always been, because we're tool makers, because we take from our environment the stuff that we need to do what we want to do, and it's always been very successful for us, um, you know, it, 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 I'll tell you what's happened. It's, it's, it's as if we've actually kind of put the sort of pause button on our own uh, process of evolution because, we've, because we have put a buffer around us which consists of uh, you know, medicine and education and buildings and all these kinds of things that protect us from the normal environmental pressures. Um, and it's our, our ability to make tools that enables us to do this. Now, generally speaking, what drives speciation is if a small group of animals gets separated out from the, um, uh, from the main body by population pressure, some geographical upheaval or whatever. So imagine a small bunch gets, uh, suddenly finds itself stranded in a slightly colder environment. Then you know over a small number of generations, then those genes that favor a thicker coat will come to the fore, and you come back a few generations later, the animal's got a thicker coat. Man, because we are able to uh, make tools, we arrive in a new environment uh, where it's much colder, and uh, we don't have to wait for that process, because we see an animal that's already got a thicker coat, we say, we'll have it off him. And so we've kind of taken control of our environment, and, uh, and that's, all very, that's all very well, but we need, we need to be able to sort of rise above that process of... Uh, of uh, 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 we have to rise above that, that, that vision and see a higher vision and see and understand the effect we're actually having. Now imagine, if you will, um, an early man, and let's just sort of see how this sort of mindset comes about. He's, he's, he's standing, look, surveying his world at the end of the day. And he looks at it and thinks, this is a very wonderful world I find myself in. This is, a, this is pretty good. I mean, look, I'm, here I am. The, the, behind me is the mountains. And the mountains are great because there are, there are caves in the mountains where I can shelter um, either from the weather or from bears that occasionally come and try and attack me, and I can shelter there, so that's great. And then um, in front of me, there's the forest, and the forest is full of nuts and berries and trees, and they feed me, and they're delicious, and they sort of keep me going. And, uh, and here's a stream going through, which has got fish running through it, and the water's delicious, and I drink the water, and everything's fantastic. And there, there's my cousin, Ugg. And Ugg, Ugg has caught a mammoth! Yay! Ugg has got a mammoth. Mammoths are terrific. There's nothing greater than a mammoth, because a mammoth, basically, you can wrap yourself in the fur from the mammoth, you can eat the, um, uh, eat the meat of the mammoth, and you can use the bones of the mammoth to catch other mammoths. <laughs> this is... Now, this world is a fantastically good world for me. And part of how we come to take command of our world, to take command of our environment, to make these tools with which we're able to do this, is we ask ourselves questions about it the whole time. So this man thinks, starts to ask himself questions. So, so, so this, this world, he says, well, who, so, so, so who made it? Now, of course he thinks that because he makes things himself. So he's looking for someone who will have made this world. And says, well, so who would have, 
made this world. Well, he must be something a little bit like me. Obviously, much, much bigger. <laughs> and necessarily invisible. <laughs> but he would have made it. Now, why did he make it? Now, we always ask ourselves why, because we look for intention around us. Because we always intend, we do something with intention. You know, we, um, we boil an egg in order to eat it. Um, so we, we look at the rocks and we look at the trees and we wonder what intention is here, even though it doesn't have intention. So we think, so what did this person who made this world intend it for? And this is the point where you think, well, it fits me very well. <laughs> you know, the caves and the forests and the stream and the mammoths. He must have made it for me. I mean, there's no other conclusion you can come to. And it's rather like a puddle waking up one morning. I know they don't normally do this, but allow me, I'm a science fiction writer. <laughs> a puddle wakes up one morning and thinks, oh, this is a very interesting world I find myself in. It fits me very neatly. In fact, it fits me so neatly. I mean, really precise, isn't it? <laughs> it must have been made to have me in it. And the sun rises and he's continuing to narrate the story about this hole being made to have him in it. And the sun rises and gradually the puddle is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And by the time the puddle ceases to exist, it's still thinking, it's still trapped in this idea that the, the hole was there for it. And if we think the world is here for us, we will continue to destroy it in the way that we've been destroying it because we think we can do no harm. There's an awful lot of speculation, one way or another at the moment, about whether there's life on other planets or not. Carl Sagan, as you know, was very keen on the idea that the, 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 the must be. The sheer numbers dictate, because there are billions and billions and billions, as he famously did not say, in fact, um, of, of worlds out there. So the chance must be that there are other, other, there's other life out there, there's other intelligent life out there. There are other voices at the moment you'll hear saying, well, actually, if you look at this set of circumstances um, uh, here on Earth, they are so extraordinarily specific that the, the chances of there being something like this out there are actually pretty remote. Now, in a way, it doesn't matter. Because think of this. I mean, Carl Sagan, I think, himself said this. There are two possibilities. Either there is life out there on other planets, or there is no life out there on other planets. They are both utterly extraordinary ideas. <laughs> but there is, the, there is the possibility, there is a strong possibility, there isn't anything out there remotely like us. And we are behaving as if this, this planet, this extraordinary, utterly, utterly extraordinary little ball of life is something we can just screw about with any way we like. And maybe we can't. Maybe we should be looking after it just a little bit better 